If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people, what paranormal or supernatural phenomenon have you experienced that has caused you to question reality? When I was about 11, my mom and I were taking my dog out for a walk. We walked past one of the houses that had a huge spruce tree out front, and my dog stopped. He had looked up into the tree, and I wanted to see what he was looking at, so I looked up too. There was something small and brown, about the size of a robin. It looked a bit like a bat, furry and brown with wings made of skin, but the torso was long, it had arms, and the head looked almost humanoid. I tugged on my mother's sleeve and asked her what it was, but she insisted that she didn't see anything and that I had been in the sun too long. Me being in the sun doesn't exactly explain why my dog stopped, though. So I've always been kind of open to paranormal things but never experienced anything, but my wife is the complete opposite. She's not down with anything remotely spooky. So one night I wake up and one side of my room is almost completely black, but the other side is fine. I chalk it up to my eyes not adjusting, but after waking back up feeling like someone was watching me, I see multiple shadow figures right off to the side of my bed. Again thinking I'm tripping, I try to roll over on my stomach, face down, and jokingly think to myself that nothing is there. Something breathes in my left ear. My wife is to my right. I think to myself, if you're actually there, do it three more times. Sure enough, I hear it breathe in my ear three more times. I about shit myself and it under the covers like a five-year-old. The next morning, I tell my wife, and she tells me she saw the same thing. Worst case. She now believes that spooky shit can happen to anyone. The Dyatlov Pass Incident. In 1959, nine hikers were on a skiing expedition in the northern Ural Mountains. Igor Dyatlov led the group, all of whom were experienced hikers and skiers. On January 27th, two days after the expedition began, Yuri Yudin, one of the hikers, had to turn back because of multiple heart ailments. On February 1st, they began to move through the pass to reach a wooded valley in which they had cached supplies. Because of worsening snowstorms, they decided to camp on the slope. Dyatlov was supposed to send a telegram to his sports club by the 12th. By the time the relatives of the hikers demanded a rescue party, it was the 20th. On the 26th, the search party, which included the police and army, found the group's tent. It was ripped open from the inside and abandoned, with the shoes and some belongings of the hikers inside. Eight or nine sets of footprints, all of which suggested people wearing one or no shoes, led away from the tent. At the edge of a forest, the first two bodies were found. They were wearing nothing but their underwear, and branches were broken five meters up, as if they had tried to climb. Nearby were three more corpses, frozen as if they were attempting to return to the camp. Authorities searched for the remaining four hikers for around two months. On May 4th, they were found buried under four meters of snow. They were the clothes of the hikers who had died earlier. Three of the hikers died from major injuries, two from chest fractures and one from a skull fracture. The wounds were inflicted by a force that was impossible for a human being to impart. And the bodies had no external wounds. One of the hikers in particular was missing her eyes, tongue, and parts of her lips, face, and skull, though she had apparently fallen into a stream. The other members of the group died from hypothermia. To this day, it is not known exactly what happened to the hikers. I was staying in a nearly abandoned ghost town. The bunkhouse I was alone in was a good half mile away from the next living person. Most of the noises I could hear could be attributed to the creaking of the building, little animals moving around outside, or the fridge in the kitchen. But at about 11 pm, I get this feeling that something is looking at me from across my room. I turn on my light, and there's nothing. But as I'm sitting there, I get this overwhelming feeling of, you need to get out of here. Not I, you. I grab my sleeping bag and book it outside. The whole time, this horrible feeling of dread and fear has been washing over me. Something big and dangerous is about to come out of the shadows and get me. As soon as I clamber into my car. The feeling goes away. The next day, I'm telling some of the folks who work there about it. One of them then says, yeah, like, three people were murdered there, so I'm not surprised. That's why we have our own cabins. I spent the rest of my time there sleeping in my car. When I was with my first serious boyfriend, I would often stay over at his house. The house itself was actually two houses that had had the dividing wall knocked down. There was one side of the house, specifically the upstairs hallway and boyfriend's room, that made me feel very unsettled. I'd sometimes have terrible nightmares there and wake up screaming. One time I was dreaming that I was lying on a stone slab in the middle of a cave with lit torches and brackets all around the outside. A hooded figure was leaning over me, pining me down, and I was screaming for help. 
I heard someone shouting get off her and then woke up. I was completely inconsolable with fear for well over an hour and had to sit downstairs with hot chocolate to calm down. My boyfriend eventually asked me about the dream and reluctantly told me his side of events. He said he woke up about 10 seconds before I started to scream. I saw something holding me down and started shouting at it to get off me. That's when I started screaming and woke myself up. I didn't stay in that house again for a long time. When his older brother moved out, my boyfriend moved into his room, as it was bigger. I never once had a nightmare in that room. My parents claim a ghost followed my mom from SC to GA, but neither my sister nor I ever saw him. The weird thing is that my stepdad used to laugh at the idea, but these days he says he saw the ghost. From what they say, the ghost is an old man who just stands next to the bed and screams silently. Sometimes they wake up, and he's there, but usually not. Again, I never saw anything when I lived with them. But my folks are sensible people with a good bit of credibility with me, and even though they have slightly twisted senses of humor, they never joke about him and rarely mention him before changing the subject. When I was younger, maybe about 11 or so, my mom and I were on our backyard porch. I had to go to the bathroom, so I go inside, and as my eyes adjust to the darkness of the inside versus the outside summer sun, I see something. This tall, black, almost silhouette-like figure comes out of the bathroom and into my mom's room. The scariest thing about it is that it looks like it was almost running, and it even doved to get through the doors. I scream and book it outside. My mom comes in, checks the bathroom, and then checks her bedroom. No one's there. At first, maybe I thought it was my eyes playing tricks or something, but in the pit of my stomach, I knew it was real. The following morning, my mom didn't seem right. It turns out she experienced things her whole life and still does. She told me she heard a knock on her window, but nothing was there. No branches around to hit it, no marks left by a bird, no out-of-place rocks. But there was one thing. On the inside of the window, near her bed, was what looked like a facial imprint. You could clearly see the brows, nose, and mouth, like someone just placed their face on the window. Ever since that day, I've experienced things throughout my life. Between my mom and me, we've got a SHT ton of stories. I was walking home one night from my grandmother's house. We lived in a village in rural Ireland. Granny's house was on the outskirts of the village, so I had to walk up a narrow country lane to get to Granny's house and back down the lane to get towards the village. My granddad was dying, and the priest gave him his last rites. He pulled through the night, and my grandmother told me to go home and get a bit of a rest. I reluctantly agreed and walked home. Down the country lane, I've been walking on since I was a boy. Only this time, it seemed weird in some way. It's almost eerie, and I never get spooked. I pushed the feeling to the side, as my mind was in shock about Grandad. I was walking towards the bottom of the lane when I noticed a blur of white down the bottom of the lane beside one of the farmer's gates to the field beside my grandparents' house. I thought it was a lamb escaping. It happens a lot. I walked towards it to investigate. When I walked towards the blur of white, it felt like electricity had entered every inch of my body. The hairs were standing up on my arms, and what was left was on the top of my head. I stood frozen in perpetual fear as the figure was an old, hunched woman in a white robe, and she just screamed the most merciful scream. The guttural scream was so frightening that I actually stopped breathing with sheer fear. I looked up into her face and saw nothing but a blur. The cry was ungodly. Like a mother finding out their child is dead. The scariest scream I've ever witnessed. Adrenaline must have kicked in because I legged it straight back up the lane towards Granny's house and legged it in the front door. I could hear my grandmother rushing out of Grandad's room, crying. She said, Grandis is gone. Imagine that he just passed away within five minutes of me leaving and encountering the woman in the lane. I remember telling my elderly aunt and a few family members about the woman, and they said that she was a friend of the family by now. She only appears when someone is going to die. I thought they were taking the piss until my father, a born skeptic and very religious man, confirmed the woman's existence. In some families in Ireland, she would be called the Banshee. I'll never forget her. Not even when I'm on my own deathbed will I ever forget the howl. When my husband and I first moved into our house, one of the first quirks of our house was the squeaky floors. What was once annoying became routine, and we didn't notice it after a few months or so. Fast forward four years. We have a five-month-old baby asleep downstairs for the night, hopefully. We have memorized every squeak and creak to be able to appropriately navigate around the house without waking a fussy baby. There's one particular creak at the threshold to my office that I started to use as a sort of alert if someone came up behind me as my desk faced the back wall away from the door. I'm sitting at my desk, taking some much-needed-me time, 
When I hear the usual creak of the floor as my husband enters the room. As I turn around, I say, hey, do you? There was no one there. I turn back around, thinking the house has shifted, and, embarrassed, I speak aloud to no one. A few minutes pass, and I hear it again. I spin around in my chair, and nothing happens. I walk out into the hall, making the floor creak, to turn the light on. Back into the office, creak, and with a quick thought of duck that. About 30 minutes pass, and creak. I jump out of my chair and turn around to find an empty doorway and a fully lit hall beyond. So I say aloud what my mother once said when I was a kid, only friends and family are welcome here. All others must leave now, for we are protected by the light. Behind me on the desk, my shitty desk lamp slams down, breaking the escape key off my keyboard in the process. Now let me say, I'm not super religious and more just believe in having good intentions towards others. But that night, I prayed. To every god there could be, is, and ever was, and for divine protection over my home and my family. I prayed for hours. I've never done that before or since, but I can confirm that there have been no more incidents. We moved in with my in-laws for a couple years when my sons were five and eight. My five-year-old started having horrifying night terrors shortly after we moved in. He was also scared to be in any part of the house alone, no matter the time of day. The hallway is long, and he would always turn on the light and then sprint down it as fast as he could. As his episodes seemed to get worse, and after a particularly creepy night where I woke to see a horrific creature at the end of my bed, I decided to claim the house. I just walked through the whole house, anointing the doorways and thresholds to bedrooms with oils and announcing that only light lived here. One day, shortly after this, my son comes in my room cheerfully and announces, Mommy. I'm not scared anymore. The girl in the hall with the knife is gone. What the actual duck, I do not know, but duckity duck that shit. My dad worked in security, and I got into it after he passed. One night I was called on my night off, they needed someone to go fill in on another site. I never worked at the site before, but hey, over time, I accepted. It was one of my dad's old sites. So it is about 2 o'clock. I am doing a round. I enter one of the buildings, and I think I see someone moving up ahead. It is 2 o'clock, and the building is locked, there should not be anyone in there. I quietly close the door behind me and creep up for a closer look. At the end of the hall is a security guard, which is odd as I am the only guard on duty at the time, so I am eyeing this guy, and I notice the uniform. It is for a company that doesn't exist anymore, in fact, it is for the company my dad worked for when he was at this site. So it hits me that it is my dad. I'm standing there watching him, he is apparently doing a round of the building I am patrolling. So I watch him, he looks directly at me as if he could see me, he looks at me for about 30 seconds or so, he then turns the corner. I ran to catch up with him but he was gone. Almost two years later, I still swear I actually saw him that night. I don't know if it was a ghost, if I was hallucinating because it was one of his old posts and I was emotional, or if maybe some time loops exist and I actually saw him working the site in the past. I honestly don't know, but every time I have a night off and they can't find anyone to fill in, I jump at it, no longer for the overtime but with the hope that whatever happened that first time happens again. I have filled in there over 20 times since that encounter, and I haven't seen anything since. So, my partner took the dog for a walk a few nights ago. It's notable that he doesn't believe in the paranormal, I have a dark attachment, which he did not believe. He walked the dog into the parkland, and as he got his torch out, he saw a figure standing by the wall, usually the kids stand there smoking weed, so he thought nothing of it. He and the dog continued along the edge of the tree line. The dog stopped and used the toilet, and Paul, the partner, bent down to bag it. A rustle in the bushes made him look up, and the same figure was there. Paul looked closer and realized the figure was a dark gray slash black, classic shadow figure, which absolutely terrified him. He and the dog started to run, and the figure charged through the undergrowth, keeping pace with him. There is no clear path within the trees, and no human could run at that speed while not falling. As he and the dog reached the end of the tree line, everything went dead silent. He didn't stop running until he was almost home. We went down in the daylight to confirm what we already knew, which was that it was impossible for any person, pranks, etc., to get through. There were no broken branches, but Paul clearly heard them breaking. Needless to say, he is still shaken up and will no longer walk on that field, as he now gets an eerie feeling like he's being watched whenever he goes over there. I am currently 17 years old. This story takes place when I was 12 and 13, and what I encountered is what I can only assume are shadow people. When I was 4 years old, I woke up and saw a shadowy man standing near my door. I attempted to talk to him, 
but he never communicated. For anyone assuming it was just a kid turning a coat or hoodie into a figure, this wasn't the case, as my door was slightly open to light and there were no coats on the back of my door or anything that could make the shape of a person. The person would move as well, so I'd see it lingering near the door and then moving to the corner of my room to the end of my bed. I attempted to talk to my foster parents, but they didn't hear anything, and none of my family members admitted to being in the room. The two other accounts of shadow people or figures would be when I was 12 and 13, when I was adopted, and in a totally different room and house layout. For reference, my room was opposite a corridor about 5 meters long, and to the right was a dresser, and to the left is my adopted parents' room. In this house, I slept with the door wide open, and there were many times where I saw a dark black hooded figure in a cloak similar to what you would imagine a cultist wearing. The shadow entity would seemingly run to the dresser and put something or retrieve something from the top, which I could never reach, and it would always go towards my room and turn the corner. As far as I can remember, it never had a face, so it couldn't have been my family overall. I had about 6 to 7 encounters with this second entity. A number of odd things happened in my grandmother's house starting in 1996, after my grandfather passed. I try to approach things with a skeptical mind as much as possible, but I simply couldn't explain some of the things that happened. One of the strangest things that ever happened was in the middle of the day. I was working a customer service job, and they had VTO, or voluntary time off, when volume was slow. I put in and was given permission to leave. I lived with my grandmother, and one of my aunts was coming in to go take her to a doctor's appointment. I assumed that she'd drive my grandmother, so when I got home, her car was still in the driveway. I thought, ha, huh, they must not have gone yet. My grandmother's house had a den, and the windows of that den faced out. There were shears and heavy curtains in that window, and my grandmother almost always kept the shears drawn while she was home. As I go to pull into the driveway, I see a figure standing obscured behind said shears. They were about my aunt or grandmother's height, and I thought nothing of it. When I opened the garage, I saw my grandmother's car was gone. I assumed whatever I saw in the shears was a trick of the light, and I walked into the house. The door to the garage entered into the dining slash bar area that was attached to the kitchen. The kitchen opened up into the living room, with the den and aforementioned windows on the other side of it. When I walked to the edge of the kitchen, I was hit by an incredible sensation of cold. I'm warm-natured and do not often get cold, especially suddenly. I mean, I wear shorts, t-shirts, and flops in the winter until it gets into the 30s. That cold was followed by the overwhelming feeling of a presence, the way you can just feel someone in the room without seeing them. The way it feels when you're in a room and someone stands silent in the doorway because they don't want to interrupt you, but you can feel their eyes on you. It didn't feel malevolent, but it wasn't benevolent, that's for sure. I said, okay, that's not funny, and the feeling dissipated. It wasn't immediate, but it didn't linger, if that makes sense. Did my mind trick itself out because I thought I saw a figure in the window, so I was on red alert? That's what most people would argue, and they probably aren't wrong. The mind is incredibly powerful, even in a simpleton like me. But, given the history of things that happened in that house and my utter and nearly complete lack of any form of hallucination, I had an auditory hallucination while on gabapentin for shingles, and never again, I simply don't know. As an interesting note, when my grandmother died in 2012, the house was sold, and my mom's remained friends with a couple that lived two doors down from us. Their daughter had the little girl that lived there over for a few birthdays, and after learning my mom used to live there too, she talked about the ghost that haunts the house, completely unprompted. The little girl's experience and what she described are not what I experienced. It is darker and more malevolent. This isn't my scariest or even my most supernatural, but it's definitely one of the ones that messed me up the most. I had a dream about a woman getting possessed. It was extremely detailed down to the point where I still remember what her scream sounded like, and a lot of those screams and screaming words were directed at me, her going between standing 10 feet to 3 inches away from my face still screaming, what her dress and hair looked like, what lights she owned, what the stairs in her house looked like, what it smelled like, etc. It messed me up pretty badly. I woke up yelling and crying, and I had to wake my parents up because I was legitimately just completely out of whack and freaking the absolute duck out. The next day, the day of my nightmare, my mother had been reading a true story about this woman who was possessed. She stopped because she claimed she was just getting very bad vibes. She asked me for the details, and I gave them. They matched. Somehow this woman's possession worked itself into my dreams without me ever having to know about it, with me seeing details that were only mentioned written down. My mother isn't extremely religious, but she immediately bought me a few protective things. I guess after hearing that a woman possessed by a demon screamed in your kids' faces for an hour, it kind of brought out the religious side of you. 
After that, I couldn't watch scary movies with possession in them for a long time because it would trigger a panic attack at the memory of the dream. So I take walks at night to keep my head clear, and one day I ended up coming across a black dog. No big deal, I stopped dead in my tracks and decided to let it go on its way, 10 feet away from me, and I saw it in almost pitch blackness. Fast forward a month or so, basically, yesterday I went on another night walk. I see it again, and this time it feels, odd. It just stopped and turned around to stare at me. Spooky. And my dumb response is to say, I hope you're not here for me. And a second later, it runs off behind a neighbor's house. Keep in mind that I'm thinking this dog is disowned or something and is just getting by with whatever it can get. Fast forward 10 minutes later, and I'm looking up at the moonlit sky, thinking of questions about what my life has become. As soon as I look down, I shit you not, the ducking dog jumps into view, at least 20 to 25 feet away from me. The fur is yes, black, pitch black, bushy tail, and the upper body was fluffy too. Like spiky, how some wolves are. It scared me at first and made me stop dead in my tracks. I couldn't tell what breed of dog it was, but it was the size of a wolf, and the problem is, where I live, there are no wolves. We started at each other for what I assume was 5 or 6 seconds, then it rushed off behind the church. I stood there for 10 extra seconds, thinking. Okay, so this is obviously some sort of sign from a god or that type of shit. But why? Then I turned to my left to walk down the sidewalk, it's a park, and it leads me straight to a street, and three houses down is my house. Second encounter, where I talked about the thing that would happen on the street if I took a left after reaching the road. Also, this is out in a country or small town type thing. The dog or wolf thing darks across the road at a fast speed, count about 3 seconds, and then it's gone. I haven't been able to conclude what the hell happened, but it seems like it was just gone. I felt like I'm crazy, but I know what I saw, and I looked up what I saw on internet, no real help, honestly. And by gone, I mean vanished, like it went past a pile and nothing, and I haven't talked to anyone about it since I'll be labeled as crazy or some other s. If anyone can give me insight on what I saw and encountered, I would appreciate that. Today I was listening to the Owls, Aliens, and Synchronicity podcast. I haven't actually even finished the episode because listening to it made me realize something about my own experiences. On two separate occasions, I have seen strange lights in the sky. Both instances were quite different from one another, in both cases, right before I saw the lights, I saw or heard an owl. Specifically, the owl is what caused me to look up into the sky and notice the anomalous lights there seems to be a direct relationship between these phenomena and these nocturnal birds, and having experienced it for myself 100% of the time I have seen strange lights, it was a pretty spooky realization. I know it could obviously be a coincidence, but humor me here. Owls are most often seen as harbingers of messages, whether good or bad, which is up for debate across the globe and across time. It's fascinating that maybe this mythic stereotype of the animal may still be relevant, and we just don't think about it anymore. It also makes me think about how Mothman probably should have been called Owlman and the sheer number of UFO sightings occurring in that area around the same time. This experience is not my own, but rather an experience that my best friend's grandmother had in her home quite a few years ago. My best friend's grandmother's family is super into the paranormal. They've had paranormal experiences in their home, where this particular experience happened. Basically, things went missing around the house very often and would turn up in obvious places weeks after they went missing. Their cats also began acting strangely, their heads moving back and forth quickly as if following something that was moving, even though there was nothing there, i.e., a bug. The cats would also follow whatever it was into other rooms, not as if they were hunting anything or chasing, but like they were investigating. They tried, and failed, to debunk what was happening, so they invited their second cousin, who is a practicing medium and has psychic abilities, to come over and try to detect the source. Here is the part where I would have noped right the hell out of there. Apparently their cousin saw trolls in the house. She said what they looked like, but I can't remember now. I never thought trolls or beings like them were real. What are your guys' opinions and thoughts on the matter? When I lived in Oregon, I worked in IT for the community college. I wasn't getting out until 9 or 10 p.m. by myself. It was a normal day, like any other. By the time I left work, it was pitch black, and the thick underbrush made it even harder to see. I drove through town and finally got to the highway that led from Lincoln City to Corvallis, which was a long stretch of empty highway that ran one plus hours through the forest. After about 45 minutes, I got to the hill, which was split into two lanes on both sides. As I accelerated in my tiny lawnmower of a car, I noticed something moving alongside the guardrail. Okay, I thought, 
it's a deer, no big deal, just slow down and avoid the cute little bugger. I was extra careful because that thick underbrush meant each side of the road would be a deep well of blackness that could have any little critters hiding there, waiting to jump into your windshield. Well, before I could finish that thought, I saw feet. If you're from Oregon, you know the homeless situation is abysmal. It wouldn't be too strange for one of them to be hitchhiking out here, but it was definitely out of sorts this late at night. Well, I decelerated to about 65, I was going 70 plus, and kept an eye on those white shoes walking up the road. By the time I actually realized those were legs or shoes walking, the man darted out in front of my Nissan in what I thought was a suicide attempt. I slammed on the brakes, trying to avoid him, and ended up sliding sideways, going 60 miles per hour in the opposite lane, while the man ran out in front of me relentlessly. All I could see was his red plaid shirt and his body as he hit the hood of my car. When I came to a stop, he was leaning on the hood, staring directly at me. The primal fear I felt was something I didn't even know existed. The high beams of my car didn't even pierce whatever this man was. It was the blackest shadow, a void. Then, in an instant, he vanished. Gone. I was breathless. I was absolutely breathless and shaking, I thought I'd killed someone. I sat in the opposite lane, sideways, breathing heavily for a minute or two. I couldn't help but scream at that point and pound on my accelerator to get out of there. I called my husband, screaming and crying, saying that I just killed a man but that he disappeared, and I didn't know what was happening. I left the scene, I know, illegal. By the time I got home, 30 minutes later, I was still shaking. I got out of my car and ran to the hood, seeing no dents, no handprints, nothing. I didn't sleep that night, here's where it got more messed up. The next day at work, I researched deaths on that highway and found that a man rolled his truck with his wife and child inside. All three died. I highlighted his name and inputted it into online. The first profile that came up was a memorial for that man. In his photo, he wore a red plaid shirt. I returned a few weeks later. In the same area where my skid marks were was the guardrail. Tied to that guardrail was, and probably still is, a moldy child's toy, a rabbit. Something is deeply, deeply haunted about that highway. I'm just glad there wasn't anyone in the oncoming lane, or I too would be trapped there along with that man. Whoever he was. This was when I was around 16 years old, so I was asleep in my small room on the top bunk of our bunk bed, with my brother on the lower bunk. My room was very much a box room, so it was around 2 meters wide, give or take, and opposite my bed was my bookcase or library. I had a lot of interesting books on there and would frequently read them every day. So one night I was asleep when I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night for no reason, but my room isn't as dark as it normally is, so I looked towards my bookcase, and there right in front of me is a large man, completely green and glowing. His back was turned to me, and in my sleepy state, I was just curiously watching him read my books. He then noticed and turned around to face me. He then gave me the warmest, friendliest smile ever. I looked at him for a few seconds, then smiled back, placed my head on the pillow, and went back to sleep. I remember feeling a bit scared, but the way he smiled at me made me realize he was just interested in reading books, as for his features, he was tall, bright green, and male. In high school, I was babysitting for a single mom and her two kids. It was the middle of winter, and when I arrived, it was already pitch black out, around 6 pm she lived in a duplex. While I was standing in the living room with her and her girls talking about how the rest of the night would go, a little boy in full snow gear came in through her front door stomped through the living room past us, and headed down the stairs to the basement. The mom never even looked at him or stopped talking. The girls didn't acknowledge that they saw him. I was super weirded out, but I was also an extremely introverted teenager, so I didn't ask the mom what was up. Once the mom left, I asked the girls who the little boy was that came in, and they both had no idea what I was talking about. So I got brave, grabbed a broom, and headed downstairs. It was a small, unfinished basement, one single room with no closets or anything. No one was down there, and the little boy definitely had not come back upstairs in that time. So, so weird, and the only time I have truly believed I experienced something paranormal, I normally scoff at ghost stories and stuff. This happened in 2008. To give some background, the part of Texas I live in was going through a pretty bad drought. So I was driving with my mom to a second-hand store we frequent. There are a few back roads we like to take to get there, it's not faster, but it's a quieter, more pleasant ride. We were driving with the windows open, it was hot but enjoyable. We turned onto the road that gets us to the shop, past a stand of trees, and then everything was just dead. The grass was the color of old hay, 
the trees had no leaves, and it was completely silent. Mom and I were shocked about how badly the drought had hit the street, but not particularly surprised, per se, it really was a bad drought. The only thing odd about it was that everything felt dead, no birds, no animals, no people. If you had told me that the world was dead, I would have believed you. We commented back and forth and thought nothing of it after that. We got to the shop, found a few knickknacks, and started heading home down the same road. We got to the section of road that was so stricken, and it wasn't. The trees were wilted but green. The grass was definitely stressed, but alive. Dogs were in their yards. There were birds calling. It was the same everywhere else. My mom and I stared at each other, and I just gunned it. I don't know what happened. I have no reasonable explanation for it. I just know that it did happen, and we didn't get spooked until everything was back to normal. My mom dislikes talking about it and gets mad when I bring it up. Her acknowledgement of it is the only reason I know I didn't dream of it. I just wonder sometimes, what had happened there to make it feel so desolate. This was my mother's. She has no reason to lie, and it's the only ghost story she's ever told. She got into family history. One night, my dad is away for a night, so she's home alone. She starts in on reading a diary she's obtained, which belonged to my dad's mother, an intensely private woman who passed away 20 years ago. It starts to rain outside. She closes the windows of her study and keeps reading. Then it starts really coming down, to the point where it becomes distracting. She kind of glances around a bit, then goes back to reading. Now, they live in a really large house, and a previous owner put an intercom system in with a unit in every room. Suddenly, the intercom in her study starts blasting a static noise at full volume. She gets up, crosses the room, and turns the volume down, revealing that all the intercoms in all the rooms are doing the same thing. She goes down to the master unit in the kitchen and kills it somehow. That's when she notices that all the pictures on the wall are taken at the same angle. That's when what she described as kind of like a gust of wind rattled the balcony glass doors and windows, which run along the entire second level of the house from one end to the other. Instead of noping out of there, she returns to the study, closes the diary, says, sorry, Nan, to the ceiling, and puts the book in a cupboard. The storm fades and stops. Nothing else happens. The footnote is what trips me out most. By coincidence, someone from her work lives on the same street, I'm going to say a maximum of 20 houses away. They're near the water, but it's a typical suburban street, they're not on sheer cliffs or anything. Anyway, she's at work the next day and says something like, so, how about that storm last night? And the guy is like, what storm? Apparently they had dinner out on their balcony and never got a drop of rain. I have had a good amount of experience with sleep paralysis, but nothing like last night. It started with me experiencing sleep paralysis on my side. I felt that stereotypical feeling like something was crushing me or right behind me, and so I woke up, or at least I thought I did, and fell back asleep on my back, hoping that it wouldn't happen again. Well, if I did wake up and fall back asleep, it definitely happened again. This time, the hallucinations were much more vivid. I was very conscious of the fact that I was experiencing sleep paralysis, so I started yelling at my mom. Eventually, she heard me and came running to my room. When she tried to open my door, she insisted it was locked and that I had to let her in. I never locked my door, and I thought this was weird. Somehow I was able to unlock the door, and she came in and woke me up. Throughout this, I still had a feeling that I was paralyzed, so I had her brush her hand up against my cheek and such to see if the sensations felt like sleep feelings or real stimuli. For a second, I was convinced that she had actually woken up and that I was safe. Then she turned and whispered in my ear. In that moment, I realized I had not woken up and was, in fact, still paralyzed and asleep. I knew it was a bad idea to ask, but I did anyway. I turned and said, you're not my mom. Who are you? She flashed me a devilish grin, and my heart sank to my stomach. I shot up, I am actually awake now. I still felt like someone else was in the room with me, but no one was there, and my mom was fast asleep in her bed. This was by far the weirdest sleep paralysis episode I've ever experienced, as I had thought a few times that I had successfully woken up just to realize I was still hallucinating. So last night I was trying to fall asleep and had a pretty scary encounter. Here's the situation, we have two cats at home, one of them sleeps in my bed every night. My sister took the cat that always sleeps with me, and ever since she left a week ago, I've been experiencing some strange spiritual activity. I can feel the cat's presence walking around on the bed, but the cat wasn't physically there. The cat then stopped walking around after a few minutes, and I started to feel fear growing in me. I started getting really scared and couldn't move, so I tried to sleep, and I heard voices in my head. 
This voice was driving a car into a big storm and was freaking out bad. I was telling this voice, it'll be fine. Just calm down, and then I started to feel the bed shake, and it was getting more and more intense as the seconds passed. I woke up screaming, and the bed shaking stopped, and I started to cry. The cat came back and was standing next to me, which wasn't helping. I moved to another room, and I slept just fine. I wonder if there's something in that room or if it's just in my head because before my sister took the cat, everything was normal. I haven't slept right in that room for some time, and I don't plan on sleeping in that room anymore. The ex-husband's family owns a massive farmhouse that was built in the late 1800s and has been passed down through generations. They inherited it from a pair of bachelor brothers and their sister, Aunt Kate. So it goes, she died in the attic, so that's why you hear pacing up there at night. She loves to take things like X Mills jewelry and move it around the house. The music room used to be used as the funeral parlor for that area way back in the day. They had the original furnace in the basement that looked big enough to burn bodies. One time I came home and noticed my cat was halfway off the ottoman, kneeling with his paws like something was not there, petting him, and holding the front half of him. I went over and ran my hand under him, not touching him, and he fell down. X was woken up one night with a lady in white standing over him, staring down at him. X is an electrician or farmer who wouldn't make shite up. Aunt Kate's room that she once lived in is freezing cold all year round. There's no AC, and it gets hot and humid in that house. One time I slept in there and had seven quilts on in the middle of summer. I went to bed with the door closed, they all squeaked loudly when opened, and the wood floor squeaked too. In the middle of the night, I sort of woke up feeling hands going up and down and me tucking the blankets in my sides like you do with little kids. I opened my eyes, even though I was terrified, and nothing was there. The door was open too, which would have woken me up from the loud squeak. I remarried and had a daughter who always saw an old man in overalls at the top of the stairs who didn't want her to go up. She's 10 now and has seen him constantly since she was little. When I was pregnant and alone in bed, I'd hear scratching or tapping coming from inside my walls nearly every night. I've had squirrels and mice in my walls before and know how they sound, this was different. It would start right by my head and slowly make its way up the wall to the ceiling, then turn and start down the other wall on the opposite side of my bed. Every night for like a month, this would happen, but I was so exhausted that I would just force myself to sleep. Then it all came to a head one night. The tapping and scratching would start as normal up the wall, but then it stopped when it got to the ceiling. The next thing I know, something has landed on the tops of my blanketed legs. It felt like a cat or something. I screamed, turned on the light, and tore out of bed. Nothing was there. I checked the entire room, under the bed, and in the closet. Nothing. I slept down on the couch that night. The next night, the scratches and tapping started up again on my wall, but I had had enough at this point. I yelled loudly into my dark room, knock it off tonight. I want to sleep. And it stopped. Just like that. I never heard another tapping or scratching sound again. The fact that it was intelligent enough to respect my wishes, though, is what scares me the most. Okay, so I need to give a little backstory first. I had this little necklace thing that had a small crystal type thing hanging from it. It had a little knob on top that, if you twisted, would turn on a blue light inside of it. The light flashes at about 3 second intervals or so. Well, me and a buddy were in my room asleep when we were like 14. I had that light hanging on my wall turned on, but my friend couldn't get to sleep with it on, and neither could I. You could see it through your eyelids the way you can faintly see light when your eyes are closed. Well, I got up and turned it off. This was just before midnight. Suddenly, an hour later, at exactly 1am, the light came back on. It woke me and my friend up and creeped us out. We ignored it, and I turned it off again. Another hour passes. 2 a.m., and it's on again. Now it was really getting weird because neither of us was messing with it. So this time I took the batteries out of it and put them in my pocket. 3 a.m., and it's back on, and the batteries are gone from my pocket. It wakes us up for the third time, and by now we were really, really freaked out. This time I took it off the wall, took the batteries out, and dropped the necklace behind my dresser. I then took the batteries and threw them under my bed and now my bed had all kinds of shit under it. Two disassembled Xboxes, various parts of VCRs and DVD players, and tons of toys. And these batteries were those little, round watch battery type things. So they clinked and clunked under there. If anyone were to try to get them, they'd have to dig through the mess of metal parts under the bed in the pitch black darkness. However, without a single noise, the light was back on the wall, flashing, at 4am we couldn't get back to sleep. We turned it off and just sat there watching it for a couple of hours. By 6, the sun started coming up, 
and it hadn't moved. So I went outside and threw it into the woods. Thankfully, I never saw it again. It was so ducking weird, and to this day, my friend and I get weirded out just talking about it. In my younger days, just after high school, I was what most would consider a vagrant. There is no home to speak of, but it is not quite homeless either. Growing up poor in a poor dying factory town, it assures a few things, but most of the kids in my town knew and understood clearly that the only way to escape such a bleak place was to leave, find work somewhere else, and don't come back unless you want to be trapped forever, and I was no exception to this understanding. It was the result of this desperate retreat from certain poverty that led me to work as a laborer in the pipeline industry. Grueling work, but decent pay. A fair start for someone such as myself. After about three months of working, my foreman, who we will call Jay, discovered I was staying at a motel and wouldn't have it. He was kind enough to invite me to stay with his family until I found an apartment, and I was grateful for his offer. Jay and his family were honest rural people who lived in an honest rural area. A house with a barn and a field surrounded by the wooded hills of Chillicothe. No neighbors, and one road in and out. It was very similar to the houses I had seen and been around growing up. It was a great area and great company, and I was thankful for such a turn in my luck. The first evening I stayed there, my wife got me situated in my room, and I became acquainted with everyone in the house over dinner. After our meal, I stepped out for a cigarette and decided the tree line behind their barn would be the best area to smoke privately and inoffensively. The sun had set, and then, by the time I stepped out of the house, the moon was high and full, keeping the valley I was in dully illuminated and casting the surrounding hills as dark shadows against the star-filled sky. It was a night that I think most would find peaceful, but as soon as my boots met the grass, that primal instinctive warning that a man gets sometimes began to slowly creep into my core. That alarm that tells you something ain't right here. Being young, dumb, and brave, of course, I shrugged it off and continued to the tree line, attempting to keep the growing feeling at bay. When I at last approached the shadowed tangle of trees and underbrush on the outskirts of their yard, I reached into my pocket, pulled out my pack of Marlboros and my matches, and struck it alight. I brought the match to my cigarette. I saw it. Mere feet away from where I was standing, just barely within the trees, was the stark and outstanding silhouette of something huge, it stood crouched and still had to be at least seven feet tall. Large pointed ears and a narrowly elongated snout. Its eyes glimmered that weird infrared color you see when animals reflect light in their eyes at night. Oh my god, oh my god, there's a wolf. That's a wolf. Were my initial panic-stricken thoughts? It was in the midst of this processing that I realized there was no way this was a wolf, because wolves don't stand upright, and this creature was unmistakably on two legs. It was slouched low, one arm hung down past its haunches, and the other was pressed firmly against a tree to the right of it. Broad shoulders and savage posture. It didn't move, it didn't seem startled, threatened, or afraid, but simply aware. It knew I saw it, and it knew that I knew. I wish I could say I did something, anything. I wish I could say that I ran, screamed, or even moved, but I was frozen in fear. Standing rigid as a statue with nothing but a quickly dying matchlight between me and whatever monstrous thing was in front of me. We locked gazes for what felt like hours, but what was really probably only moments, and as though the creature had decided it was done, terrifying me. It straightened up and backed away slowly into the darkness of the trees. No sound. There was not a broken twig or rustling leaf to be heard. As soon as my legs allowed me, I ran like hell back to the safety of Jay's house. I slammed the door behind me, and I was met with a look of concern from my foreman and his wife, who were watching TV in the living room. There's something out there. It was the only thing I could gasp for. Jay exchanged a glance with his wife and looked back towards me. Boy, if you're going to stay here, you need to understand that there are things out in the woods that you'd better not pay any attention to, he said it so nonchalantly, like he was talking about last night's football game. You hear a strange noise and ignore it. If you see a strange shadow, you ignore it, and if you get a strange feeling, you come inside and forget you felt it. There are things out there we just don't understand, but we respect them because it's their land. We just live here. It's been 15 years since my encounter with that creature in the woods, and I still think about it often. Though I stayed with Jay and his family for another three weeks after that night, I never felt easy on his property. That feeling never left, that warning stayed alert, and I will never go out to the woods at night unless I have absolutely no other choice. Once you know what's out there, you never see things the same again. I know this might seem far-fetched, and I know that many won't believe what I'm saying, but I had to share. I remember I was about seven at the time and looking away from the rest of my family. This was a very small graveyard located at an old mansion in Nova Scotia. 
Now I looked around and saw a large black dog. At the time, I thought it looked almost like Beethoven the dog, but it was all black, and if I recall, it had red eyes. Now that I am older, I can say it was probably more like a mastiff or a bulky hound dog. I ran to my mom, telling her there was a big black stray dog loose. I wasn't afraid of it, I was just weirded out since there was no owner around. I always loved dogs as a kid. She looked and didn't see anything. Sure enough, I turned around, and the dog was gone. It was flat landed, and the graveyard was small. Being a large dog, it had nowhere to hide. It just vanished. Years later, I found out my dad had seen a large black ghost dog that attacked him as a kid, and my grandpa on my dad's side saw the same thing and told my dad about how he had shot at it, having seen it while he was hunting, but the bullets didn't affect the dog that chased him and eventually disappeared. Is my family cursed by a ghost dog? Why did they seemingly only attack my grandpa and dad but not attack me? Our dogs had the same description, but mine wasn't scary to me, it just stood and watched. Honestly, looking back on it, it felt more like a guard dog. My dad's side of the family is French, and when I look the dog up online, it seems to be an English folklore thing usually tied to death or churches. My whole family sees and feels a lot of paranormal stuff, but I have never really seen this possible ghost dog, though it could have been a stray dog that just ran quickly, but being big, it would have made noise. I am kind of the ghost repeller of the family. We've lived in a few fairly haunted places, but nothing ever comes after me or spooks me, which is good, I guess, since I'd probably be terrified, but how come I don't see ghosts and several family members and friends have in areas I've lived in? What does this black dog mean in life? I wonder if it was protecting me from something that day. The place we went to was supposedly haunted by a soldier or something. I was about 19 or 20, in college, and still living at my parents' house. They were on vacation, and I had gone to a gathering at a group house where a bunch of my friends lived. I brought our family dog with me because she was super laid back, and it was a small group of people hanging out. It got pretty late, and I didn't feel like driving back to my parents' house, so I crashed on the couch, as did my dog, at my feet. I was exhausted and fell asleep pretty quickly. I was woken up by snarling and growling, and I sat up quickly when I realized it was my very sweet lab mix. She was standing, her lips curled back, and her hackles were totally up. My eyes went to what she was snarling at, and my entire body cemented in fear. On the coffee table was a green, glowing mass, about two feet wide and three feet high. My first bizarre thought was that it looked like the Slimer character from Ghostbusters, except that it had no discernible features. It was emitting what sounded like an electronic pulse, almost like the loud hum of a refrigerator, but it was pulsing over and over again, like woom, woom. Each time it pulsed, a light inside of this thing would brighten, then dim, then brighten, then dim, in time with the pulse. It was like it was breathing. It was bright green in color, not a natural green, but almost a neon color, like antifreeze. I grabbed my pup's collar and held her back, because she was going nuts and straining for this thing. Like a child, I threw my blanket over both of us, hoping it would go away. I could still hear the pulsing sound, and I could see the on and off glow through the blanket's thin material. So I closed my eyes and said, go away. It didn't listen. I had no idea what to do or what this was, but I felt as though I was being scanned from head to toe, casually and with no fear of what I might do. I had an icy fear crawling up the back of my neck, and I wondered if it was about to take me somewhere I did not want to go. My dog was still freaking out, but she was staying put on the couch, and I peeked out again. It was still there. My mom, who is Catholic but who is also very well versed in the weird and supernatural, had always told me to say, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord when faced with something that seemed evil. Well, the religion never stuck with me, and I felt using that when I was not religious might not work. So instead, I hid under the covers again and said, you are not welcome here. Leave and never return. If that didn't work, I was going to grab my dog, pop over the back of the couch, and run into one of my friend's rooms. The sound stopped suddenly, and then I heard an odd whoosh and a pop, and when I looked, it was gone. It was just starting to get light out, and I grabbed my stuff, put my dog on a leash, and drove home as fast as possible. When I later told my friends about it, no one had heard a thing, and most of them just thought I was dreaming it. But obviously, I wasn't, and my dog was the one that alerted me to it in the first place. I have never seen it again, and I hope I never do. And I honestly have no idea what it was. I feel like I have been haunted by a woman. She started showing up when I really started having a big crush on a real girl I used to work with. I first encountered the ghost woman in a dream. I was some sort of agent working for the military who took care of paranormal entities. Oddly specific, I know. 
In the dream, I have a radio, and the people I am working with are hunting down a target. That's all I know. At one point in the dream, there is a pale, naked woman chained to a flag pole in some outdoor area. It looks like the deck of a ship, and I am on the inside of the ship. I make my way to the door to open it. The sky outside turns black, bright white lightning begins to flash, and the wind is so strong I can hardly move the door. I finally open the door, but the wind takes it right off the hinges, and it flies away. The woman is screaming on the flag pole in demonic fashion. I am now brandishing a large silver dagger. I grab the chains holding the woman down so I can close the distance between us and kill this demon with the dagger. I am unable to wake up from the dream. Since then, I see her every once in a while. Sometimes, when I close my eyes, her face will appear with black eyes, a veil, black hair, and very pale skin. She hasn't harmed me, just creepy looking is all. I don't really get scared when I see her because she looks familiar. I have no idea what her intentions are. Friends of mine have suggested everything from succubus, to guardian angels, to demons, to just my imagination. I haven't seen her in a little while, but I am sure I will again, in one form or another. When I was a kid, around 8 years old, I lived in a townhouse across the street from a nursing home. The setting of the day was night, and my parents instructed me to take a shower. The bathroom was upstairs, everyone was downstairs, including my brother, so I was completely alone. I had to face my fears of being alone, so I did what I was told. I'm upstairs now, taking a shower, everything is normal. Things took a turn when I had to gather my clothes from my room down the hall. I stepped out into the hallway and saw what appeared to be a misty or soft glow by my doorway. It appeared to be tall, but I couldn't make out a shape. It was an apparition, something that my eyes had never seen. I was stuck and couldn't take my eyes off the apparition. It felt like an eternity, but something in my soul told me to run, mostly out of fear of the unknown. I ran downstairs to my parents, distraught and butt naked. I told them that something was upstairs, and naturally they went to investigate. Long story short, my parents felt like something had been watching them, but my scare confirmed their suspicions. My aunt ended up coming over to bless the house, but we moved a few months after the incident. I have never experienced anything else besides the feeling of being watched, but ever since then, I've been a fan of everything paranormal. A couple of friends, and one hot roommate, rented a house in the next city over. One floor. Had a partially finished basement. The owner started the job but never completed it, only the outer walls and one interior room were put in. The main area was open, with a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. Scattering of old furniture around. My friends used to use the basement to host parties. Apparently, there was a standing request not to sleep down there, a request that I did not hear. We were maybe 20 or 21 at the time. Well, after one party, people started going to sleep wherever they could find space, and I picked the only open spot I could find, this old couch in that basement. I wake up after just a few hours, it must have been 4 or 5 a.m., and I hear a guy and girl whispering and giggling in that partially built next room. It sounded like someone who was at the party, so I got up to ask them to be quiet, and as soon as I got near that doorway, it stopped. Weird but I thought maybe I was hearing people still partying upstairs, and it just sounded like whispering through the floor, no biggie. It didn't start back up, so I decided to ignore it and try to go back to sleep. I laid back down. That bright light was shining in my face, and I wasn't sure how to turn it off, so I closed my eyes and just tried to fall asleep anyway. While I'm lying on the couch with my eyes closed, I see a shadow move across my eyelids, as if something moved between me and that light. So at this point, I sit bolt upright and say nope, 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 nope over and over again as I start walking towards the stairs. The cement floor was a bit uneven, so I'd hear a scuffing noise with some of my footsteps, but I'd hear it even when my shoe didn't scrape the floor. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs and listened, and those shuffling footsteps kept going, so I sprinted up the stairs and paused one more time at the top and looked back and saw. Nothing. I don't know, I expected to see someone. I waited maybe 10 seconds, listening out, and finally I heard what sounded like a single footfall on wood and the creak of that bottom stair. I shut the door behind me and backed away, watching it, but nothing ever came through. I'm frantically trying to find one of my friends who rented the place without waking anyone up, and I find the roommate on an air mattress in the living room, which is weird, but whatever. I start shaking her, and I go, see. See, wake up. Your basement is haunted. She just looks at me like I'm an idiot and says, duh. We told everyone not to sleep down there and I just went, oh. So can I crash on the corner of the air mattress? And she said I could. So the next day, 
I got all of the ghost stories from them about this house. Apparently, the main floor was haunted too, and the basement was just the worst spot for it. So from where I live, Asia, there is this thing called a supernatural weatherman. What they do is basically control the weather by supernatural means. To do this, the weatherman usually asks us to perform a certain ritual and gives us a sacrificial offering, usually food or something really trivial. Usually things go wrong when you don't do what the weatherman asks you to. Even in this modern society, most people from my country still call them when they need it, like, for example, when there's weeding by holding off the rain. One method that I know of is by using gin. So anyway, six years ago, we were having an event in the middle of city square, and it was rainy season too. One of my friends was tasked with finding a weatherman. He managed to find one and ask us to put four cigarettes on the event location as an offering and eat a banana on the day of the event. We decided to pack the cigarettes one day before the event since we were setting up one day before the event. Anyway, one of our friends didn't know that the cigarettes were for the offering, so he decided to smoke them. When you smoke a cigarette, it turns into ashes. That evening at 21.10, a volcano located 311 km east of us suddenly rose to level 4 alert. By 22.50, it had erupted. The wind was blowing to the west, and by 2 hours, the ash had reached us. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not. But people from my country still believe in supernatural stuff. Personally, I don't believe it, but at the same time, I do believe it. We have this term in our language called believe and don't believe. One day, my girlfriend and I went on a late gas station run to get some snacks and stuff. That gas station is less than 3 minutes away, but on the way home, I turn on the street that my home street is off of. At that time, I stayed in a rough neighborhood, and a lot of the street lights did not work, were dim, or teens had shot them out, so it was pretty dark. As I was approaching a stop sign in my left ear, something, just a soft but firm, pretty assertive voice, told me, turn off your lights. The voice, or whatever it was repeated, was very rapid and continuous, like those people who read disclaimers at the end of a TV commercial. I couldn't tell if the voice was male or female, in my opinion, it could have been both. Now, referring to the lights, I was confused at first about what the voice was asking because I was driving, but all I could hear or focus on was that voice telling me to turn off my lights. I heard this quickly and continuously for about 10 seconds. In those 10 seconds, I heard someone turn off the lights about 50 times just to put into perspective how fast the voice was speaking. Instinctively, I turned my headlights off. As soon as I did that, my girlfriend immediately asked, what are you doing? Then we both saw a glowing white ball shoot from behind treetops that did a little zigzag and vanished. We were both freaked out at that point, and she grabbed me, crying and asking what it was. I couldn't explain it. I told her about the voice I heard and what it told me to do. To this day, we talk about this random thing that happened about 3 to 4 years ago. When I was in my early 20s, I was a part of a very small doomsday cult disguised as a witch coven. We used to gather in a shed that our leader called the sanctuary. We spent a lot of time in the shed playing with a homemade Ouija board, our leader mainly used it to try to make end of world predictions. Part of me wonders if the entities that we spoke to were actually just products of the idiomotor effect, but I also wonder if we invited something supernatural into the shed. One night I was hanging out in the shed with our leader and my best friend, who was also a part of the cult. We weren't playing Ouija or doing any sort of magic. We were just sitting around talking. I was sitting facing the shed door, and they were both facing away from the door. As we were talking, I saw the doorknob slowly turn. The guy who ran the cult lived with his mother, and she was the only other person on the property at the time. She was a devout Christian and hated that her son participated in witchcraft. She never came down to the shed, but when I saw the doorknob turn, I thought it was her. I remember thinking, why is she coming down here? Then the door opened, and no one was there. Our leader got up and shut the door. He shrugged his shoulders and said, the wind must have blown it open. I said, no, I saw the doorknob turn. He said, well, you know there are thousands of spirits on my property. He had told us on several occasions that thousands of spirits were attracted to his property, and at the time I believed it. I had no problem believing in spirits back then, but now that I am a bit more skeptical, I wonder what happened that night. Just as a disclaimer, I have nothing against witchcraft, and I don't think that witches are bad people. The guy who ran the cult was a bad person who used witchcraft for his own twisted agenda. When I was in high school, I was part of a play in a local community theater. In one of the first play practices, myself and the other actors were sitting in a circle and reading the script, essentially a table read despite not having a table. There were roughly a dozen of us actors, 
mostly high schoolers like myself, with a few adult roles as well as the director in the room. The theater building is locally famous for being haunted, even though I myself am a skeptic of paranormal activity and do not believe in ghosts or anything of the sort. As we were working through the script, I looked up and noticed roughly a dozen silver orbs in the room. They were arranged generally in a circle, about the same diameter as the circle we were sitting in. They were a dull, not mirror shiny, silver and about 2 to 3 inches in diameter. They reminded me a lot of silver Christmas tree ornaments. The orbs were near the 10-foot ceiling but not completely level with each other, so anywhere from maybe 7 to 9.5 feet in the air. They were slowly, maybe an inch or second, descending. When I noticed them, I pointed them out to the group and said, what are those? However, nobody else indicated that they could see the orbs. I described them and was somewhat confused that nobody else could see them. As the orbs descended more, I stood up and examined the closest one. I moved my hand close but did not actually touch it. Neither the orb nor my hand affected one another, I felt no heat, there was no reflection on the orb or on my hand, and the orb continued its slow descent without otherwise moving. I moved around it in a semicircle, as it was now about head level. This revealed one of the more puzzling aspects, which is that from my perspective, these orbs occupied space. By this, I mean, they were not like those eye floaters you get when looking at the sky that move around as you move your eyes. Other than a slow descent, the orbs occupied a space that remained constant even as I moved or looked around. The entire time, I was asking the others if they could see them, pointing at the one a few inches from my hand. Every one gave me strange looks and said that they could not. After a short while, maybe a minute or so, all the orbs quickly, but individually, fizzled out of existence. I said to the others that they were gone and sat back down, somewhat embarrassed and confused. I have thought about these orbs for years and cannot explain them. 